What makes for a good or a bad missionary? Are we all on the mission field in some sense? And are the usual tactics and conversations used in evangelism kind of old fashioned and maybe out of touch with modern listeners? We're gonna be talking about all things missions and apologetics and more on today's episode of Theology On Air. Well, welcome back to Theology On Air. We are, of course, an offshoot of Theology by the Pint, where we talk about all kinds of interesting ideas around theology and philosophy and faith and culture with a good craft beer in our hand. And if you want to know about our local events or come to them or just who we are and all that kind of jazz, you can go to theologybythepint.org and learn everything there is to know. Upcoming events, we've got, um, we're going to be talking about aliens and demons. We're going to be talking about homosexuality. We're going to be talking about if the Bible sometimes gets it wrong. Mm. Spoiler. All the spicy. Actually, I'm not going to give a spoiler. You have to come and find out. Yeah, spicy, spicy. I'm going to say no. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's good. Uh, I'm Sarah Stone. I'm the executive director for Theology by the Pint. I'm joined, as always, by Evan McClanahan, senior pastor at First Lutheran here in Midtown. And a repeat guest today, Bill Scott, who is, well, I'll let you introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are. Round two. Yeah. Thanks Woo-hoo. for having me back. Yeah. Um, well, my name is Bill. I am a chapter director for Ratio Christi at Houston Christian University. And what is Ratio Christi, real quick? Oh, good question, Sarah. Thank you for asking. Oh <laughs> Ratio Christi is a campus apologetics missionary society. So we like to um, plug into college campuses and just make a mess. No, I'm make just a mess. <laughs> we, we, we try to, you know, it goes without saying there's some pretty, um, pretty bad worldviews being, mm-hmm. bring, just coming down the pipe in, in the world of academia. System. Yeah. yeah. So here we are. You know, we, we're those voice for Jesus on campus. We take, we evaluate the worldviews. We teach students how to think through them. We, you know, disciple students. And we kind of operate on this uh, statistic that three out of four mm-hmm. born again students walk away from their faith in the first three years of, or first year or two of college. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's sad. And so, it's, and, yeah. and it's not, listen, you know, it's crazy. It's not even just Christians that, that are feeling this. I was talking to a Muslim the other day and said they wanted to send their students to a Christian university here, in, to Houston Christian University, because they said, well, at least you guys believe in God. some sort of God over there. Wow. Because they're feeling the same way even in mosques. So this is not just like a Christian problem. Yeah. It's a, it's a anti-religious thing that's yeah. going mm-hmm. on. So. As Rochelle Christian missionaries, we plug ourselves in there. We we do evangelism on the campus, and that's that's one of the big things that we try to emphasize. We're not ivory tower apologists. We want to take the ideas from the ivory tower and put them on the street level, which is what we'll be talking about. Today. I was going to say that's a great segue. Yeah. Today's podcast is basically born out of a conversation that Bill and I had on the phone, and I was like, "This would make a good podcast." So yeah. you can be the determiners of if it makes a good podcast or not. But can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, the other big. Campus group is Campus Crusade for Christ. They don't call they're, it that anymore. It's just crew. crew. Yeah. Crew. Well, I know, there's I wanted, crew. For the old timers, I wanted to throw the back. Old well, timers. And also yeah. there's navigators uh-huh. and in and in uh, Texas. Christian yeah, FCA is I mean, they're they're making big waves. They're winning I, winning I, Supreme Court cases and things. It's pretty awesome. It's, I uh, I only ask because it might tie into kind of like different ways of doing apologetics or mm-hmm. evangelism or something. Like do they like why, why do you need more than one? Oh, yeah. Group on a campus. You know what I mean? I don't know if y'all are like rivals and you want to understand or something. No, we try not to be rivals. We want to be complementary to those groups because they all have their different emphasis. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, You know, the navigators are really good at doing the like Bible study and one on one things. We've got a great navigators group on on HCU's campus. I always see those guys having coffee Mm -hmm. with students and stuff. and, And so we want to come alongside a group like that and say, hey, our specialty is apologetics. This is what we do. We do Bible study. Mm-hmm. We do, and just like navigators do apologetics too. Yeah, from time to time. But our our main thing, like this, is our bullseye is yeah. apologetics, and specifically apologetics and evangelism. Which, to me, I think that's that is a greater test of the adequacy of your apologetics if you're doing it with this current generation, the future leadership of America right now, and you're taking the apologetics and putting it to them, that's a, uh, to me, uh, this is going to sound terrible, but it's the best example I can think of. To me, that's a greater test of your apologetics than a peer, peer-reviewed peer journal that was read by yeah. 10 or 20 academics and said, this is a great argument. You know, Well, that's kind of what we're going to get into today, because yeah. you just used two words, and we're going to have to define some things. By the way, when I was on, when I was in college, 
I ended up at the BSU, which is now BCM, the Baptists, Mm -hmm. because that's where the cute boys were. Um, That's not changed. But Campus Crusade, when I was in (laughs) college, they really went after like Greek life. So there they talked a lot and hung out a lot with the, you know, sororities and fraternities. And then InterVarsity was a little bit more kind of nerdy and RUF. I mean, they were all they had their own niche. Yeah. So they weren't competing, but you found which niche kind of worked for you. But the niche that Ratio Christi fits in, you've used the word apologetics like 16 times now. If people listen to this podcast a lot, they know what that is. But we want to climb in today to like, are we are we living in a world that's sort of post-apologetic? So before we get there, what is apologetics? Apologetics, biblically defined, um, is just to make a, a defense for something. It comes from the word ap- apologia, the famous verse, mm-hmm. 1 Peter 3.15, which says, you know, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And I think that's key to every ministry, really. Um, and be ready always to make a defense for your faith. Um, it goes on to say with gentleness and meekness mm-hmm. too, which should be part of your methodology. Yeah, apologetics is also seen in Acts seventeen when Paul addresses the Athenian scholars and use their own um, their own cultural um, beliefs, or- beliefs and things uh, to build a case for uh, the validity of who Jesus was and specifically the resurrection. And so he was using <clears throat> poetry and and quoting philosophers and all these other things. And then it's also, um, a lot of people don't think of it this way, but if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I think we ought to be talking about this more. It's also a um, direct line of defense in spiritual warfare because you Hmm. are, you you know, what you see there is that that Satan has put these strongholds in people's minds. And Mm -hmm. and part of the job of, if you're doing apologetics well, is to tear down these strongholds, which are a hindrance to true Christian belief that sets the heart free. Give an example of like what a stronghold might be and how having some apologetics knowledge in your head, how that might play out to help somebody. Sure. So, so uh, a stronghold is you think of it like a military tower that's guarding a city. Yeah. Okay. And, and the way Paul was using it in the context of uh, second Corinthians 10 was, it was a, um, it was a defense it, that was it's it was exalting itself against the knowledge of God, and so, so the way it'd be better just to probably read it from from Scripture really quick, and that way we can get a quick context. Okay. But it's um, <clears throat> but today it's like what, you know, like what I encountered last year in um in Africa, for example, was. I have it open if you want it. Huh. I have it open if you want it. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Um. Yeah, it says here. Let's see. Okay, it's New International Version, which I never, <laughs> never read. Like, sorry, I read NET and New King James versions. Like, where is this? Okay, here we go. Um, <clears throat> For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world, but on the contrary. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every uh, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And so, you so this is the part of apologetics that is like not only evangelistic, but it's a discipleship oriented you know approach too. That you're that you are. There are ideas in this world that are totally contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that are totally contrary to uh, appropriate discipleship. And sometimes Christians, like myself, brought that worldly baggage into my walk with Jesus. And thank God for apologetics and good apologists who uh, helped me think through some of the things that that, that I brought with me. Um, but to I'm going to push see. you a little bit because I, I want an actual example, like a okay, belief um, or a <clears throat> practice or something that somebody... Well, it could be fake. Know, it doesn't have to be like my well, friend Bob, you know. Oh no, no, no. For for example, uh, with me personally, you know, I came oh, from here a very. Here it goes. Let me get juicy. <laughs> when I when I became a Christian at twenty six years old, I was an an atheist turned agnostic Buddhist, and I I brought some of that in with me. I you know, thinking of like a new age kind of mindset, um, universalist kind of ideas from you know, and there's a part of me that knew that was wrong. But there's like, but how do I do away with this? Like, how do I explain it? Uh, my biggest apologetic problem was um, the deity of Christ. I was like, so Jesus, like, I, I get that Jesus is my Savior, but I was so ignorant of Christian things. I was like, but he's God in the flesh? Like, really? Like, <laughs> I mean, so the 
the pastor at my church <clears throat> uh, gave me um, Lee Strobel's book, The Case for mm -hmm. Christ, and that was the, my introduction to that. It was like, oh, so this is who Jesus is. And so in that, that regard, it was a discipleship thing. Um, yeah. And the other side of that, a couple of years ago um, in Florida, I was giving, I gave a historical defense of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and two people got saved that day because, mm. because that, they finally understood that, like, oh wow, like this is real, this is true. Where was that that you were giving that talk? That was in like what was the fort? audience? It was in a church. It was so they were coming to church, but they had not yet. Started. They were on the sound team in the church. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, so I don't know what their backstory was. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it was a so church you're saying we need specialized ministry for sound guys. <laughs> well, we never know. Well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but now it. I'll, I'll I'll tell a story too, and, sure. and go into some other avenues. Would, would I mean I was in the in the camp of the college student who, you know, and for me, it was studying Bart Ehrman because I took oh, yeah. an oh, Old man. Testament and New Testament yeah. class. So you read Bart Ehrman's standard academic text. For those listening that don't know, he's a um, author that is not very friendly to the Bible being reliable for, or trustworthy or well, authoritative. He was, I mean, he's like a former evangelical. Yeah. Yeah. And, former evangelical. you know, he's a, you know, he's probably one of the world's foremost New Testament scholars, although many of his critics say he goes far beyond his scholarship. I mean, yeah. his scholarship was actually relatively limited, but he kind of yeah. goes on to make a lot of sweeping claims. He's gotten into wrote, wrote a book about suffering, and actually, it was the question of suffering that actually led him to lose his faith, uh, not the New Testament work. But mm -hmm. he does spend a, some of his time, at least, calling into question the validity and reliability of the New Testament scriptures. Mm -hmm. For example, he has the famous quote that has been wildly mis, you know, wildly requoted, but I think misunderstood, which is there are more mistakes in the New Testament than there are words. So if you've ever heard that, that's from Bart Ehrman. Mm -hmm. And what he means by that is that if you take all of the manuscripts of which we have an abundance of riches, yeah. and you look at every slight textual er error or misprint or something like that, which could have 99% of which have absolutely no meaning at, right. at all. Don't affect the content. Yeah. And, and and every time you have one scribe make 10 copies of something and that, that, that mistake is repeated, then it's now repeated 10 times, but it's the same mistake. Anyway, so yeah, you end up with hundreds of thousands of quote unquote mistakes and all these copies and there are only, you know, so many hundreds of thousands of words. Mm -hmm. And so, but when, when you're, when I was in college, I was like, <clears throat> oh crap, they made this whole thing up. This mm -hmm. thing is like man-made. Right. I, 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 I thought, you know, Luke wrote Luke and whoever yeah. wrote this and, you know, it, it is what it is. So, and, you know, I basically had a Sunday school version of faith at the time. Lutherans didn't do any apologetics from the pulpit, didn't give me any advance notice of what I was about to get into. So it took the rebuilding process came in the defense of the validity of the scripture, at huh. least in part. So like Good. Craig Evans, um, yeah, yeah. you know, we've had on, didn't we have him on? We haven't had him on, but oh, if okay. you're listening, Craig, yeah. we're coming I, for I you. I had him on my old radio He's wonderful. Show. He's an archaeologist, a professor. Yeah, yeah, so he he debated uh, Bart Ehrman. Uh, James White uh, debated Bart Ehrman, and both of those debates over time, you know, really helped me hmm. you know, understand the reliability of the scripture. But also, then you have to get into, um, in fact, there's a book right behind you, the King James controversy, written by James White, which ends up being a, a lot about the manuscript traditions. Yeah. So th just as an example, like if. The, the word apologetics of the world is new to you. There are so many avenues you can go down. There are, like just yeah. Just the notion of like the manuscript traditions and how they traveled in the ancient world and how we found them <laughs> later and how scholars and critics kind of right. reassembled the New Testament. That's a whole thing. And that doesn't even get to theology. But that just gets to whether or not when you open the Bible, can you trust it? Can you trust yeah. it? Yeah. Well, yeah. When I did a master's, like you just said, um, when you do a master's degree in apologetics, you feel like you're doing a master's degree in literally everything. Yeah. It's like this this touches everything. Right. Everywhere we live, you know, from paintings in an art museum to Lord of the Rings to um scriptural apologetics to or scientific to physics or something. Physics, right. science, history, uh, philosophy, yeah. history. It's yeah. it's a really um um, I heard somebody say once I explained it to them, they said it's basically it's basically a degree in like classics or liberal arts mm -hmm. or something like that. It's because it's just so wide, you know. And but when in the world that we run in, like when I hear apologetics or I see your podcast or another similar podcast to ours, I I've, I've started becoming a little bit cranky about the fact that, and I'm hoping you'll get me uncranky. Um, the people that love apologetics seem to be fellow apologists. The people that love the evidences for Christianity seem to be fellow Christians. And I've, I've become a little bit cynical. I, I love apologetics, but I've become a little bit cynical about the actual sort of usefulness 
of apologetics in the real world with millennials and Gen Zs that um, they're not asking the questions that maybe they were that, you know, boomers and Gen Xers were a long time ago where they were like, well, hey, but is there any evidence for this stuff? Like, can you prove it? And now I feel like most people just kind of are like, I don't really care. So it doesn't matter that you're like, well, I just learned the teleological argument. And did you know, <laughs> you know, so I guess, can you speak to, is, is the world of apologetics just kind of an echo chamber? No. Okay. I don't convince think so, me. I don't think so at all because um, working in academia, I get the privilege of seeing students come alive every year being introduced to apologetics. Where I just had a student in my office just the other day. He, uh, Nancy Piercy is one of the professors at HCU mm -hmm. and, um, he, he walks into my office and um, he said, you know, after having Nancy Pierce's classes, classes, I've realized how much I absolutely love this stuff. And he's like, I'm going to law school, but first I'm going to get a degree in apologetics. So is can, he a believer? Yeah, he's a believer. Now, that, we can this talk, is my question. But we can talk about non-believers too, but I'm just saying as believers, as believers, um, I think I think the church is doing a disservice to, and by the church, I mean like, the church, yeah. the big church. Globally, yeah. <clears throat> We're doing a disservice in neglecting apologetics in our discipleship. 100% agree with that. And so when the way that fleshes out to non-believers, um, I, I see this quite often. I think you're right that <clears throat> learning the teleological argument for yeah. God's existence. That's like fine tuning. And, and you yeah. could just say fine tuning, and you it, know, you know, and it's, it's a logical syllogism that follows like five steps. And I presented yeah. that in a church, um, last Sunday and it was a church with a bunch of NASA scientists and stuff. Ooh, fun. And they loved it. Yeah. They were like, this is what we see. This is what we yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what we have to do with, with Gen Z is we have to, we have to do better than that. We have to get beyond just the logical syllogism up here on the board and say, this is what this, mm -hmm. and so therefore God. Right, right. Ta-da! Ta yeah. <laughs> you know, like, now, now you believe, right? We have to, we have a lot, we have our work cut out for us, not just in apologetics, but even in preaching, is that we have to be able to, um, in our apologetics and our homiletics, which is like, you know, the science of preaching and things like that, we have to be able to get into people's imagination. We have to be able to get into people's heart. I mean, I think one of the best preaching classes I had in my undergrad was a, um, narrative homiletics where it talked, he actually used um, Dunkirk as an example. And he's like, sermons ought to look. And he actually, another example that's a little one that I'm more familiar with was um, he said, our sermons need to look like the first 45 minutes of Saving Private Ryan. It was like mm -hmm. how he started a lecture. I was like, he That's said. That's intense, yeah, but was, it will win awards. But <laughs> oh. because he said, you know, even in our preaching, we need to put people there. That's what Spielberg did okay. with that. Yeah. We need to put people there. And it it's not like we can stand up and preach the doctrine, and we should never neglect to do that because right. we have to do that. But we also have to put people there. Contextualize and, it, yeah. And contextualize it and make people realize, like, why is – why is Jesus saying this to this Samaritan woman next to this well? Right, it's and it's a different conversation her. than he had with someone else. Yeah, yeah. and then how, why did Jesus talk to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 one way, Samaritan mm -hmm. woman another way? And why is Paul quoting all these Greek gods in Acts 17? Mm -hmm. Like, why is he doing that? You know, and so, so so with apologetics, I think that's, that's one of the things that we need to um, take into consideration is it makes, makes Christianity real. Yes. You know, and it... And, in, and to quote uh, Malcolm Gott, who's a, a poet, um, I think he's from, I think he teaches at Oxford, Anglican priest, he, um, he said he has a really great uh, video on YouTube that talks about this for the C.S. Lewis Institute. It's like 20 minutes long. It talks about the Christ in all things. We need to be able to be Christians, uh, Christian enough in our mind. When we look at the beauty of a tree in a park, we see Jesus. When we look at the beauty of a sunset, we see the beauty of God Himself. Like we, when we see a new movie that's making all kinds of waves in the movie theater, we need to be able to look at that and say, "Where is Christ in this, and where is He not in yeah. this?" You know, and be able to and and I think that's the strength of apologetics is it it touches every part of people's lives if it's done well. So everything I hear you saying makes me think, <clears throat> and I think. Every all three of us would agree about this, that apologetics is incredibly useful for the believer 
to enrich their faith, to give them sort of the um, courage that they've got a lot of really like good evidence behind what they believe. And sort of, and then that can launch them out to do evangelism. But my question, which I want to get to here for the rest of our time is forget Christians for a minute. If we're, if we're even going out into the world, we're not just hanging out in our cool, nerdy, apologetic echo chambers, but we're actually going out and talking to non-believers who've never even heard of many of these things that we're talking about. A, how is that helping? Um, and like how much of that are we using because it's just already in us and it's empowering us? Are we actually using those arguments? Um, basically what I'm saying is how do we be a good evangelist? I think a good evangelist knows what to say and, 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 um, but they also know how to say it. Yeah. But a good evangelist should also, and I try to, I teach this to our students quite a bit and, and anymore, even last summer in Africa, you know, People were asking that kind of question, like, how do we reach this group of certain group of people? Like, well, I would say sometimes, and a lot of apologists make this mistake, sometimes you need to listen before you start making a defense. Sometimes sure. Sometimes we do not um, learn about other we, people. We don't hear where somebody's coming from, and we try to make an answer for something, and we're, we're answering a question they're not even asking. Right. We're answering our own what we think they are. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes that's... Um, I'd say I have a lot of children. That's a good way to be an evangelist. Um, <laughs> but hope they believe the same thing you believe. Yeah. I don't know. I, who, who are the, uh, you know, who are the great, let, let me say this. I think apologetics is often a phase. Yeah. Like you go through a phase where, I mean, I know I did, where, I, I mean, again, personal story. After a certain presidential election, which will go unnamed, <laughs> and I found myself despairing about the future of my country. But more to the point, I thought, to myself, here I have all these like moral issues that I think are really important, like abortion, things like that. And then I, and, and, but it, you know, those things have like political overtones. And I thought, well, people are never going to agree with me politically unless they agree with my worldview. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, because like the politics that I think are important are because this worldview is important and the right. worldview has, it has outlays, you know, it has, it has practical ramifications. So how do you, how do we get the people to share my worldview? Oh, so apologize. So I went from political debates and podcasts and all that to throwing myself headlong into apologetics for the next like four years. And so I actually wrote a couple of books. Um, you that, wrote two books? Uh -huh. Yeah. No one's what? ever read. They were basically like <gasps> novels of apologetic argument, like trying to like put it in a fictitious world where it was oh. like real. Imaginative yeah. apologetics. It was like that. That's what and you they call it. And, 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 <laughs> but can we get signed copies after we sure, record sure. this? Cool. <laughs> uh, no, no one's ever allowed to see them. Um, but uh, anyway, but so I was really into that phase for a while and, and, and all of that. But it does kind of get to be a phase because but, – but evangelism is evergreen. Yes. Like we can always evangelize. What, what frustrates me about the apologetics community is if you're not putting yourself in intentional spaces, places, if it's not on your calendar in some way, mm -hmm. to put yourself in a place to talk to unbelievers, there's a word for, you know, doing something just for your own pleasure, you know, where it's like <laughs> you just, we learn something to build yourself up, <sighs> you know, and sorry that uh, <laughs> anyway, so you have to me out with boys. Yeah. So I, I just, I just, that is my concern. Where it's like we puff ourselves up with knowledge. I mean, even Paul says, you know, yep. knowledge puffs up. Where we like put your money where your mouth is, yeah. kind of. So, like, I'm fortunate. I'm at a church where we have a community college. So I'll sit outside and try to talk to students. And and in some conversations, those apologetics they come back, you know, and and they can be useful to kind of, you know, but really to kind of raise to like overcome objections. Apologists will often say there are two reasons to do apologists. One is for unbelievers, but mm -hmm. the other is to strengthen believers. Mm -hmm. And I find my, the longer I was in the apologetics world, the more the second one seemed to like get, be more important because there just isn't a lot of evangelism going on. Let me ask this. Who have, who have been the successful evangelists? You in, know, in like American history, maybe? Yeah. yeah. I mean, people think Billy Graham. Yeah. You know, Amy Simple McPherson. What? That's controversial. Mm -hmm. I don't even know that name. Oh, the four square <laughs> gospel. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. She's yeah, she was like in L.A. in like the twenties. Kind okay. of the very of the controversial. Word of oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I would say it, she was heretical. <laughs> she disappeared for a year. Probably had a child. Um, <gasps> it came back. Yeah. There's a whole story about how she was controversy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you said but, have children, so she's yeah. just doing what you said. Well, no, I mean she was like divorced or something. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, B Billy Sunday, but but you know the thing about like Billy uh, the Graham, Billy, B Billy Graham. Yeah, I think he. I think a lot of people probably came to faith. Um, 
But, you know, they what they tried to do is when he would roll into town is get in touch with churches, right? And so when people came forward at the end of the thing, and they peppered that with their own people, by the way, to encourage more people to go forward. Yeah. But they would put them in touch with a local congregation. I, I have a feeling there was not a lot of follow through, but I don't know. I've also heard stories of people say, yeah, I went to a Billy Graham rally and I, you know, I walked forward, you know? So I yeah. don't know. I, I don't know what the answer is, I guess is what I'm saying. But Billy Graham didn't do any apologetics. No, and I think Billy Graham was, I think I, I think I heard him say something along the lines of like, he really believes that less than 5% of those people that came forward truly made real confessions wow. of faith. Hey guys, Sarah here. Sorry to interrupt what I'm sure is an amazing podcast episode, but I just wanted to tell you that Theology by the Pint is growing. We are now a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we're expanding. This coming year, with your help, we'll grow our reach by adding events in multiple Houston suburbs as well as launch a youth version. Don't worry, those will be pints of iced coffee, not beer. Uh, We're adding follow-up conversations to reach the spiritually curious and the unchurched. We're also growing our connections and partnerships with more local churches. And you can help us grow by praying for us, by telling your friends or church about us, and of course, by partnering with us financially. To donate, go to theologybythepint.org forward slash give. You know, if each of our podcast listeners gave $100, we would reach our annual budget right then. Consider donating today. Okay, enjoy the rest of the show. It is life too. And I think that's that's a perfect, perfectly good question because I think a lot of evangelism, to be honest, is very uh, thin. I think mm. it's very surface level. I don't think I don't think we take the commission, the Great Commission, as seriously as we should because we tend to look at that as sharing our faith, whatever that looks like. I mean, <laughs> you you watch one one YouTuber's doing it one way and then mm-hmm. you know Group A over here has another way of doing it, and they hand them this pamphlet and walk through these four spiritual yeah. laws. And right. look at this diagram on my water bottle. You well, know, yeah. on my water yeah. bottle. Yeah. I know why I mentioned crew because it's a real the, thing. Their method the is the yes. four spiritual truths. Or There's yeah. that. However many there are. So, yeah. and what we've done, what we've done largely wrong. Um, and I've always been critical of this uh, for ten years. I've been on this soapbox. What we're doing wrong with our approach to the Great Commission is we're only making converts and we're not making disciples. That was we, where I was going next. We, for, awesome. we forget that the that the Great Commission was, yeah, go therefore, baptize in my name, and teach all that I've commanded you. Mm-hmm. That's that's part of this. Not just get people to say the sinner's prayer. And why do you teach somebody something? I mean, you teach yeah. them you teach them to catechize them. You teach them to you know get them into the faith. This is what we believe. You're attending a, you're Lutheran. So you're attending my Lutheran church. Here's the Lutheran. I'm sure you guys have it. I'm not Lutheran. I'm sure you have some sort of statement of faith, probably some more catechism. They just use the Bible. Yeah. Just use the Bible. Okay. Uh, Just take them straight to the Sermon on the Mount and just go from there. (laughs) Yeah. But no. No deeds, just (laughs) creeds. Oh my gosh. We spin it on that. No, but, but in all seriousness, um, we're taught by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I think that mind part gets neglected a whole lot when we're talking about discipleship and we're talking, you know, and and you're right. I mean, part of the strength of evangel the strength of one of the strengths of apologetics is definitely discipleship. If you have a, a student who recently got converted is 17 years old and you prepare them to go to college, if I'm going to prepare a student to go to college, they're going to learn some apologetic methodology, not necessarily like arguments, like this is this is the end-all argument. We're going to learn the Kalam cosmological argument. That's all you need, buddy. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, would, I would want to think that we would want to teach our disciples how to think Christianly. And I think mm-hmm. that's grounded in God's Word, first and foremost. And secondly, when you look at all these other issues— what apologetics really does is say, okay, LGBTQ, that's a cultural, that's got so much cultural baggage right now. If you're a Christian, you're pretty much written off as a bigot just, mm-hmm. just for even saying you're a Christian in that right, kind of community. de facto. So how do we think through that? And how can you do that apart from looking at apologetics and looking at, you know, like, uh, you're coming back to the not the teleological argument, but the teleology, which mm-hmm. is a big fancy word for uh, telos in the Greek is perfection. That's where we get like the goal, the purpose, the purpose yeah. in which we were created. And that's one of the strongest arguments, I think, right mm-hmm. now. I heard this here, case in point. And you got, I'm in a room right now where people know the answer to these questions. The early church 
What was their theological problem? What did they try to figure out? How do we define who God is and what is the Trinity? For the Reformers, their theological problem was what? Justification. Justification, mm-hmm. especially the church. What does it mean to be the church? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, what is it? So ultimately, because to answer the question of justification, you have to decide what your ultimate authority is. Exactly. Yeah. Right. What is the big problem for theologians today? What's the big theological discussion going on? What does it mean to be human? Mm. <laughs> You talk about to me, it's like two steps backwards. It's like mm-hmm. the stuff, the mm-hmm. stuff that we used to take for granted. Uh, the source on that was Colson Center, by the way. Mm. So apologetics uh, group, and that makes me think: like, what are people asking then? What does it mean to be human? It's right where we live. It's right at our doorstep. Yeah. So to be a human being means what? You know, for a Christian, that means that you're created in God's image. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. It's your anthropology, you know. Yeah, you're, a you're not. You need to be forgiven. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You're a sinner, but then when you are forgiven, you have a new identity in mm-hmm. Christ. You become a child of God. You you're become, a male. Yeah, you be, or female. Yeah, that's part of being created in God's image. There's a mm-hmm. telos to you, right? Yeah. There's a biological telos going on there, hmm. and that applies to everybody. And then, then when you get brought into the faith, you become a child of God. You get accepted in the beloved. I'm just going through like the identity in Christ. Just a few mm-hmm. of those, you know. You immediately become a child of God, according to you know John one twelve. You become accepted in the beloved, uh, become part of the priesthood of believers. You're given um, spiritual gifts. Yeah, you know, spiritual gifts. There's all these things, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, why don't we go there hmm. <laughs> first? Like, yeah. that, as an apologist, that's what I think through. Is like, what what are these people? What are these people asking out here? And I'm not saying these people like the LGBT community. I'm saying like Gen Z. The people in the West right now in the United States, and now these worldviews are trickling all over the world. You yeah. Know? Well, I'll I'll, I'll say so, I, I do ask that because when I do my outreach to college students, the placard I have out most often, the visual is of a an embryo, maybe six to eight weeks developed, with the words "human being" on it, and that gets the most people to come up and, hmm. and talk to me and say, "What What are you doing?" Basically, it's like, who are you? What's wrong with you? So, yeah, and my, my, so my argument is pretty obvious, though, right? Like, if that's a human being, then it, it the, its life ought not to be extinguished. But I do want to go back a step. Sure. Your theology determines how you do evangelism mm-hmm. and, and apologetics. And so if you have the, the, the – I mean, this is a big problem, I think, in evangelicalism, which is once saved, always save theology. Or, you know, once you make the decision, you're in. You get your ticket yeah. punched and you're done. That's mm. why we don't have fire retention. insurance. That's why people who go to the Billy Graham thing they don't show up because yeah, it's the fire insurance and they're good. Oh, I stepped forward. I went. I went. I walked the aisle at the church and they said the prayer over me and they said I was saved. Yeah. So yeah, they were converted, but they weren't discipled. So then you yeah. have a question of can you be converted and then unconvert? Now that gets into other yeah. things. It's another podcast for another day, but it does. I mean, it gets yeah. back to what yeah. are we doing with the studies that we are. A better question might be that would be more all encompassing is. Are we really glorifying God when our intention is to only make converts? When hmm. He's called us to make right. disciples, or Dang. or are you? Bill doing, Scott dropping fire. Are you doing a baptismal drive? You know, before <laughs> the annual report needs to be written. Oh gosh, right. what's the motivation? Yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. I want to I want to just rehearse something you said, and then I want to get into like missionaries, like the mission field. You said the early church was asking questions about who is God. Mm-hmm. The, at the time of the Reformation, we're asking questions about what is the church. Yeah. But now the question that people are asking is, what does it mean to be human? Yeah. That's fascinating. And you're right that it's backwards. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the things that we took for granted. It's right. Like, like to be human right. 50 years ago was to— No one was asking about yeah. gender or, yeah, yeah identity yeah. kind of stuff. Get married, have kids, raise family. Yeah. You know, and now it's like— well, I don't know what it means to be. That's human. so heteronormative of you but, to do that. But there's there's some good biological, you know. Let's look at some chromosomes. Yeah. What are you ta- like? No, that's not what it means to be a male or female. Right. You know? And I'm not saying that to be like I'm saying that with my hands in there, going like, this is this is the attitude toward us. Yes. And so, how do we be Jesus with the woman at the well mm-hmm. with that people group? Mm-hmm. Because it is a people group, and now it's a global community. So let's talk globally, because so. you've done some work in Africa, and I want you to tell a little bit about that. Because being and so you're in one sense you're on the mission field when you're at HCU among college students. Sure, you're on the mission field everywhere you go. I That's mean, right. right. Uh, aren't we all? That's yes. the whole point. <laughs> but you're our guest, so you are the one I'm going to ask these questions to. Um, <laughs> but you've been to Kenya. 
a couple times and you also do some virtual stuff with different groups. So, and I know you do a lot of work. The last conversation we had with you was about um, like the Muslim community. So maybe talk a little bit about what missions looks like and how the things that you've learned in the apologetic world, how do they work themselves out in boots on the ground missions? Well, what we're seeing right now is there is a global interest in apologetics. Like I, when I was, when I went, the first time I went to Africa was 2019. Okay. In 2019. What was the situation? You went to like a church, you went to an orphanage, you just on the street with a bullhorn. What's the. I was, I was doing what they lovingly call over there a crusade. That's not a very PC word. Ooh, yeah. But that's. I think they'd lovingly call it something else. Okay. Yeah. But no, I went over there primarily with a group um, that. It was somewhat an apologetics trip, but it was more more an evangelistic trip, and and a lot of people were born again through those those uh, meetings. With it. They boy, you talk about when you do. It was a ten day revival in okay. Bombo, Uganda. Was part of it, and then I went and did another conference in Mombasa, Kenya, and then came home. And while I'm while I was there, the primary purpose of me being there was to just kind of inform them on the Word of Faith movement and what that was all about and how not to, don't give your money to these people because they're they're not. Wait, back it up a second. You were doing missions in Africa, and mm-hmm. one of your primary objectives was to warn them about a false version of the gospel. Yeah, because it's everywhere over there. It's, okay, it's, and this is, by the way, when we talked on the phone, what got me thinking we should do this podcast because yeah. I was like, dang, I did not even think about the fact yeah. that you would have to sort of – do some defense. And, and the thing is, is like when, when we talk about this over here, um, we tend to just say like, oh, you know, people that follow that stuff, it's just whatever, you know, like they're, they're strange and that's false teaching and whatever. Over there, these people are good, godly people. They just don't know any better. Yeah. You know? And a lot, a lot of times it's just ignorance. You know, they just don't. So someone has gone over and taught them word of faith, oh, prosperity, no. health Doesn't and health. Doesn't take anybody going over, Sarah. Oh. They, they have, they'll have a Daystar satellite on the side of their little hut, like bringing in Christian programming. Oh, 30, so they're watching programming. 30 channels of it. Uh, and then, and then Benny Hinn shows up in Kampala, Uganda, and rents out the oh, soccer stadium. Stays in a twenty thousand yep. dollar hotel room a night, yep. and gets money out of these people. And I and they and it doesn't cost. I mean, for for an American going over there, the most you'll pay for a meal in that in that country is like four bucks or yeah. something like that. And they're giving them they're giving him like. 20, 30, 40, oh. 50 dollars. By the way, for those of our listeners that don't know who Benny so, Hinn is, you can go back and listen. Yeah. We interviewed his <clears throat> nephew, Costi Hinn, which was fascinating, but um, oh, I, bet. I, I think he's teaching a false gospel. So yeah. we'll just, yes. okay. Well, definitely. So it's, Benny, it's Benny to make it, to put it, yes, let's, yeah. let's Costi, do, good. Benny, not so good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's two different hens there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, Let's put it like this. It's the name it and claim it prosperity gospel stuff. So that was my, that was part of it like that. Okay. But really, you know, you have 10 days. I, Preach twice a day. I had twenty sermons or something in that ten days. It was like a marathon. It wears you down. Like uh, you're you're held together by the grace of God. <laughs> I don't really think of that as apologetics, though. I think there's just well, it a, wasn't a, apologetics. A, a, That's what I was getting to. Oh, I, I wasn't okay. doing apologetics. I was over there doing um, doing sermons that lean toward like what is what is salvation, mm-hmm. sanctification, just basic doctrinal type sermons to try to teach. Because I'm big on that. I really yeah. think. Uh, you know, it's like the first two days was focused on salvation. It's like now all these people have come to know God. Now let's talk about now what's, that next? Sh- what's next. Yeah, now you get to. So when I was over there, apologetics, there was um, an interest only because I brought it up, but I hadn't started a master's degree or anything. I didn't start that till a year after. So I had really no training or anything formally in it. I, they were just, um, they were like, you know, so what is this apologetics thing? And I can remember one day in Uganda, we sat around a table for four or five hours talking about apologetics. And I was just giving them lists like, well, check out G.K. Chesterton, C.S. <laughs> Lewis, check out the, you know, and um, talking about all of it. And then I go to Kenya. No big deal. Nothing, you know, didn't even talk about apologetics there. Just did some doctrinal sermons and then came back home. And, um, you know, and just wasn't thought about. There wasn't anything like, like culture war going on or anything there. Yeah. So the shift happened um, in a big way. There's some people already working on the ground um, that had um, apologetics ministries, like Apologetics Kenya, um, ACFAR, which is an African Center for Apologetics Research, and people like that. 
and their primary focus was cult ministry, you mm-hmm. know, because there's there there are Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses everywhere you look over there, um, and I mean they're like street preaching Mormons, not like nice knock on your door. They're like screaming in the streets and big stage and all this stuff, very evangelistic and very. Uh, and that, and Africans look at that and they say, "Wow, look at the zeal of these Passion. Mormons. They must they must be a you know must be right." And then something happened there in fe- last February. Jill Biden landed her plane around February, I think it was 21st, in Nairobi. On that same day, the Supreme Court met in Kenya and passed monumental gay rights legislation there. In Kenya, in gay Kenya. rights legislation. Now, okay. to put that in context, I was there, you know, you know, after the Obama administration. When Obama tried to do that, Kenya basically told him, like, if you don't stop talking about this, you're going to have to leave. We're not, yeah. we're not, we don't want anything to do with it. So... <clears throat> Excuse me. So that shifts so that shifted so much by 2023 that um, when I when I was talking to Apologetics Kenya, they're having they're wanting me to come over, and that's not even my specialty really. Like I like world religions, I like all kinds of other things. I was not anticipating talking about this, <laughs> but I was being nice and I asked Kevin, "What do you want me to talk about?" And he said. Oh, brother, Sexuality. if you could talk about LGBTQ ideologies, we need that so bad. And I'm like, why? Yeah. I was there in 2019. Like, yeah. there was nothing. This is not even an issue. He said, it is now. You hmm. need to watch the news. So, of course, <laughs> I looked up Gospel Coalition in Africa and other things. It's like, what's going on? Well, they passed that in February. Um, they passed a bill that, that was good and bad. The good part was homosexuals were being thrown in jail for 14 years up to that oh. point. So, well, so they no. It, it, see, we have to be careful. Though our word like homosexual meaning what? Meaning someone who fantasizes about having sex. Someone with who practiced someone, someone practices, who practiced homosexuality, but it was all in fa- public. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, I so mean, somebody who is thing. known to have homosexual yeah. relations in a public manner. Yeah. So practicing homosexual could see prison time up to fourteen years. Yeah. So that went away. Yeah. Which is good because at that point, up to that point, it was largely a very closeted issue in in Kenya. So they there was no target for evangelism. How do you even evangelize right. people? Right, no one's here, nothing to see. Yeah. yeah. So immediately, just the right with that though, that same decision, they allowed um, the homosexual community to set up non governmental organizations. They just call them NGOs yeah, for yeah. short. So guess who set up all the NGOs, like all the all the ones, all the neoliberal ones here in the United mm-hmm. States? Mm-hmm. Where was the first place they attacked? Churches and mosques. Mm. <laughs> and before you know it, you have like all this cultural shift taking place, not just with a sexual revolution, but also Christians and Muslims working together, fighting cultural battles for the first time maybe ever mm. over there. There's all kinds of stuff happening because of this. And, and gay people were marching in the streets and all these things. And so... Of course, the knee-jerk reaction with no, um, you know, they don't have Nancy Piercy over there, uh, you know, writing. If our listeners don't know, Nancy Piercy is a professor, author, apologist, and she does a lot of work right. with like gender and sexuality. She and- wrote a book, a monumental book, really called "Love Thy Body." That's really, really one of the best books you can read about this. And, and she, she, we interviewed her about it. Yeah, there it's you on go. Podcast somewhere. There you go. Well, yeah. find you can find a podcast about mm-hmm. it. And so, and so, they don't have a professor. Piercy over there that's written a book and in their context and all this other stuff. So their default apologetics was, you know, holding up signs saying it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve type, you know, stuff. Still and, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Still which, works. Which, which Maybe Evan works, can go to Kenya yeah. next. Which, yeah. So, so Evan might like that, but actually that was one of the, the examples I used to say, like, this is how you don't do this. <laughs> like, don't, do not do this because – what you're saying there is that, hi, we see you, but you're not welcome here. Yeah. You know, like we're here to just throw some quick polemic pun at you yeah. and just write you off. And I said, when the statistics show, and, you know, and this was like groundbreaking for them, so groundbreaking for them. I mean, it's like common knowledge for us, but groundbreaking for them. When I shared these statistics, they were like, You've what got, statistics? You've got to get on radio programs. You've got to get on TV shows. You've got to like. You've got to share this. So here, are the, like yeah. statistics, like UCLA School of Law. I don't have them right in front of me. Right, you know. Um, <clears throat> I think it said that um, suicide attempts of the um, 
gay community was 35% compared to another survey that said it was 2.3% for everybody else in the past like three years. Just stuff like that. Okay, statistics it's like showing health. that it's not a, a viable lifestyle. Right. It's like mental health statistics. So okay. like here, here's a community that obviously has problems, suicide problems, um, the, the, the majority, every stat, every secular stat you look up. Um, I've not seen one yet that doesn't say that at least over half of these people um, within the LGBT community have suffered some sort of sexual abuse mm -hmm. from their child and mm -hmm. things like that. Things that that feminist lesbian Camille Paglia says that we're not even allowed to talk about this within the gay community anymore. Things like hmm. that. And so that's that's the two. So when you think of this as an apologist, there's one side saying. Okay, well, homosexuality is unbiblical. I can make a case for that real quick. That's, yeah. that's so I can make that so fast. It's yeah, you know, and and um, the second homosexual I led to the Lord, that was his question. I want to know what the Bible says about it. Mm -hmm. Within fifteen seconds, he knew what the Bible says about it. First Corinthians six nine and ten. I mean, it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. We all know that. Guess what? Every gay person we talk to knows that already too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they know that. They know what the Bible says about it. That's why. Why do you think progressive Christians have done nothing but try to undermine the Bible every time that they, every time they put some sort of meme out or some sort of public, you know, progressive mm -hmm. Christian. They're they're trying to undermine the authority of Scripture because they know that Scripture does not back up the things that they're trying to push. Yeah. So they have to make a new authority. So we know that. Like, that's an internal, external issue. We all know that. So, so what it's almost do I, like we need to presuppose the— Stop. You know. <laughs> He's referencing an off-air conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, um. but, but you can point them to Scripture, in other words— but are they even asking scriptural questions? And are they are what they're looking for is acceptance, home in the church, like belonging, where, belonging, and and uh, and God help us. They 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 need they need counseling. They need help. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I'm treading on dangerous ground, even saying they. I don't want to mischaracter. Yeah. Could be a gay person out there saying like, "Well, I was never molested as a child. I've never thought of suicide. Yeah, yeah. I'm not part of that." They. What are they talking about? I'm just saying the majority. If they're reaching out to us, it's probably because they they understand good and well what the Bible says about it. Maybe it's because they're looking for some sort of like hope somewhere. Because mm -hmm. it's like I told told people and so if if Kenya follows the same trend the United States followed, what's gonna happen next is well, counselors aren't going to be allowed to right. tell people. That'll be conversion therapy. Yeah, yeah that's conversion therapy. Like, well, we you can say, convert people from male to female or female to male, but we can't convert them from, you know. Non-believer. Yeah. Oh, wait, I, I want to throw like a, I think on soccer it's a yellow card or something, um, because I, I hear what you're saying. It's, it's the same issue with like abortion. Like I think we need to be very firm. Abortion is wrong. and then yeah. But then people will say, well, wait a minute. If you don't talk about it the right way, you're going to alienate those women that have had abortion. So, okay. Then I think what we need to do when we talk about this issue is we need to say the gospel is sufficient, you know, that the, the death of Christ is sufficient for the forgiveness even of the sin of abortion. Sure. So the gospel applies to <clears throat> you if you have had an abortion, you're not out of the kingdom of God. Also, abortion is wrong. Yes. Yeah. So and that so I'm a little like I want to make sure that like, you know, when we're talking about like the issue of homosexuality, you know, if, if there is someone who again, I don't even like the word homosexual. That's, yeah. If a sodomite Okay, that's the biblical phrase. Um, wants to repent of that act, and they want to come into the church, and they they will no longer perform that act. Arms are open, one one hundred percent, as First Corinthians six says. But such were some of you. Paul is directly speaking to people who had participated hmm. in that act directly. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that isn't my experience coming in from a liberation theology driven, you know, denomination in the old days, which is where, no, we want God to accept us as we are. We're going to yeah. continue to, to, to behave in that way. You know, so like, so that's where it gets tricky because it's like we, the, the call has to go out to right living, but to repentance, acceptance at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. But in your experience, was it people who, cause there are people who are victims who, who are habituated into that lifestyle, who are mm -hmm. brought into that lifestyle through child prostitution. And mm -hmm. it's not a small number of people. No, it's um, not. It, in, especially in that part of, you know, well, so, I, I was going to say undeveloped parts of the world, but it's rampant here too. So Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we have to be great, you know, very loving towards people who have found themselves in that lifestyle. I had a fascinating conversation with somebody in Kenya that said, that told me, like, 
we have to understand, like, I don't like blanket terms like homosexuality either because what that does is that presupposes that homosexuality looks the same everywhere you go and it doesn't. Yeah. And whenever you go to, when you go, when you're talking to a gay person at Voodoo Donuts over here at <laughs> Montrose, okay, versus talking to a gay person like my cab driver in um, Kenya, you know, um, he was the stereotypical homosexual um, man in Kenya. Um, what that means is Kenya has a very strong cultural appearance is very important there, which means you, you as a man are expected to have a family. You're expected to have a child. And so part of that expectation, same with a wife too, you know, wives expect to have a husband, have a child. So in a lot of cases, the marital agreement is I have this man over here that I love and have loved him for 10 years, but in my culture, I can't marry him. I will marry you because I like you. I think we could all get along and, you know, we'll have children. We'll hold it all together. And that man, I don't know, it was all God, obviously. But I told him, like, I, you know, I don't hide behind what I'm doing when I'm doing mission work anywhere I go. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's healthy to do that. I don't think it's healthy to, um, you know, if I if I if I taught in the Middle East tomorrow, I would be there saying, I wouldn't say I'm a missionary. I'd say I'm here to teach you the Bible. That's what I'm here to do. Like, I'm not going to hide behind that. Over there, the guy asked me what what he wanted, what am I doing in Kenya? Because I look, you know, like a business person. I said, I'm uh, doing some lectures on the LGBT movement. He's like, what's your thoughts on it? And I'm like, well, uh, I think it's uh, sinful, and I think you can come out of that, and I think you can. God will redeem you. He redeemed me. I wasn't homosexual, but I came from a very sinful lifestyle and shared my testimony a little bit. And he said, I don't think people can repent from this one. Hmm. Because because you're born that way, yeah. I'm like, okay, let's talk about that. I was born a lot Long, of bad ways. Yeah, I was born, yeah. So, uh, forty five, <laughs> yeah, forty five <laughs> minutes later, he's just about to drop me off at my house at my little my little flat that I was staying at, and um, he goes, "I'm a homosexual." He just said that like out loud. I'm like. I, that's very, I'm very proud of you for just coming out and saying that, knowing where I come from. And he's like, he said, yeah, I don't share it with many people. And um, he said, I would like you to pray for me. Mm. He said, um, I've, I'm, um, I have a wife. I have a kid. She leads worship in church. I was like, wow. wow. I said, do you go to church with her? He said, no, I don't go. I drive a cab. I work to try to avoid it. But I know what's wrong. And mm. And he said, you know, but I've never known a day in my life where I wasn't attracted to men. Yeah. So it's like, you know, on some level, it's like that's where my heart is. It's like those when you have something like that, it's not just it's not just so um it's not just so easy to just just write that off. You know, it's like here's somebody who wants wants hope. There that he he wants to think it's there. It's like like the the homosexual boy that I led to the Lord I was talking about earlier. It was that verse that Evan mentioned that that led him to God, really. He didn't get saved that day, and I don't expect homosexuals to get saved that day. It's almost like witnessing to a Muslim, right? It takes sometimes, like, that's such a deep-seated stronghold in somebody's mind. Like, sometimes that has to take time. But he said, I went to this church, and they told me I'm fine. I went to this church. God loves me for who I am. I went to this church over here. They said, I'm going straight to hell. He said, I want to know what you think. You seem like <laughs> Neither a Neither of the churches are right. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, let's forget about what I think for a minute. What does the Bible say? Yeah. And I pointed him to 1 Corinthians 6, 8 through 9. And um, I was quite a firebrand at that time in my life. This was several years ago. And I was like, this is clear. Neither homosexuals nor sodomites will enter the kingdom of God. And this is what it says. And there's all this other list and drunkards or all these other people. He said, And I said, and such were some of you, and you were justified, you were sanctified. And he cried. He immediately started crying. I was like, "Oh my goodness!" I was just right in the public pizza place. I'm like, "Oh no!" Like, "Oh I've no!" Made, I've made this. <laughs> I've done it. Now. I've made this. Sean, I made this kid cry. I've made Sean cry. And it was a very small town in eastern Kentucky. Everybody knows him. Everybody knows me. I'm like, "Oh great!" The preacher's over there, like beating up on the gay kid, you know. But he looked up at me and he was like, "And such were some of you." Mm -hmm. He said, "You mean?" Do you mean to tell me that God would take somebody like me and build the early church with them? Hmm. And I was like, man, 
It cho- totally, I get choked up every time I think about that because it totally changed the way mm. I address that community right mm. then and there. I was like, here I am saying like, you need to repent, you need to repent. It's like, he knows he needs to repent. What he needs to hear is that not only the severity, but the goodness of God That's that right. Paul mm. talked about. He needs to see that there is room for repentance. Like there is hope for that in my life. I mean, I yeah. don't know how. And and in his mind, I never said it. There was something the Holy Spirit did with him. In his mind, it all just made sense. God used people like me mm-hmm. to build the early church. Well, I wish he got saved then. It took him about five years and uh, drug addiction. He finally got saved in a rehab um, last summer. And then... Mm-hmm. Um, hadn't heard from him in two or three years, and he just called me up out of the blue and was like, hey, are you still in Kentucky? I'm like, <laughs> no, I, I live in Houston, Texas now. He's like, oh, man, I got saved about a month ago, man. I just got out of rehab. I'm not like I'm doing good. I got a job. I'm like, oh, hold on. Like, you got saved? Like, you repent of, yeah, I repent of homosexuality. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I'm like, wow. Dang. He's like, yeah, the desires are going away. It's so exciting. And I was honestly, I just wanted you to baptize me. I was wow. Like, I'm like, well. Are you going to do I'll, it? Well, I did in December. Okay. Yeah. I said, well, I'm not going to be in until December. This was like October. And I'm like, I'll be in for Christmas and I'll bat, we'll set it up. And we found, um, you know, my little the local church that I, I usually attend while I'm back in Jackson, Kentucky. Um, pastor was happy to do it. I made sure the pastor was in the, in the baptistry with me and was like, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, to baptize him by myself because I want him to have a connection immediately to this church. Yeah. You know, cause, and I got him, uh, um, hooked up with my friend down here. Um, Mike Newman, be a great guest for your podcast on this issue, by the way, he's done, um, mission work, equipping the church, doing LGBTQ stuff since the 1980s and just brilliant on this stuff. Former homosexual himself, um, speaks several languages. Great guy. Got Sean connected with him. Now they're meeting online. He's helping disciple him, work through stuff. That's very so, cool. So it's like, so it's, but what, one, I say all that to say this, like, that's one of many stories I've seen. Every homosexual that I've ever led to the Lord always comes from a place of sharing the goodness of God. Yeah. More than the severity. They, It's like they already know the severity. Their whole life is a severity. Hmm. Like, like the suicide rates are through the roof. Why is that? They're miserable. They're just looking for hope. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, I mean, <clears throat> beautiful stories, but I want to kind of get back to this idea of when you're on the mission field. Um, when we talked on the phone, you were talking about how when you're on the mission field, you're not just sharing the hope of the gospel, like you were just talking about, but you're also combating all of these other, I mean, this right. really sounds like all the letters that Paul and Peter wrote, like talking about false teachings, you're combating other religions, right? Islam, Buddhism, whatever. You're combating fringe versions of Christianity. Mm-hmm. Like I would say like Beth, like the NIR prosperity Absolutely. gospel, um, but also cults, Mormonism, Jehovah's witnesses. I mean, talk a little bit about what that's like. How do you tell them like, Hey, no, we have the real, real one. Like, how do you convince them? Like, oh, I know you've heard from Mormons, or I know you've heard from these prosperity gospel people, but they're wrong and we're right. Like, how does that work? You have to. There's like a positive negative approach, really. Like, there's a positive apologetics in the sense of showing them what Scripture actually teaches, because all these cults they they're based upon erroneous interpretations of Scripture in so many ways. Um, you know. So just pointing them to scripture, but also exposing what these cults teach, yeah, which they never do. They, for instance, last year I was I, I was eating um, dinner with my buddy Danson, who's who's the founder of, of ACFAR, the African Center for Apologetics mm-hmm. Research, and he's primarily a cultist. Like that's what he does. Is he's always just combating cult movements. Makes it, if you're a cultist, it makes it sound like you've started a cult. <clears throat> Just saying, well, you might need to think of a better title. He, he's a he's a he's somebody who is constantly doing apologetics to try to get people out of cults. Like James so Walker. Yeah, yeah yep. kind of like James Walker. And he's, um, yeah, and so he, he's working on that full-time, writing in the African context, getting published in the Gospel Coalition in Kenya and all this other stuff. I mean, he's really a smart thinker. Boy's speaking all over. And he does it without even – he uses public transportation everywhere he goes to. I mean, he's just a servant, you know, to do this stuff. And he's so quiet and so gentle and so nice about it. It's like when he opens his mouth, people listen. And so we're sitting, we're sitting there at this big uh, 
this uh, big like food court area, and we're just talking about apologetics. And he said something about Mormon. Mm-hmm. And our waitress just goes, oh, I'm a Mormon. Oh, goody. <laughs> and he was like, are you Sit really? down. I got some stuff to tell you. <laughs> he said, and how long have you been a Mormon? And, and she's like, well, a year. And he's like, oh, okay. So are you being taught the Mormon doctrines and things? She's like, well, we're just Christians. He's like, I don't think it is. Really? Why is that? And after he explained to her the history of the Mormon church, she said, I've never heard any of this. Right. And so I was there for about three weeks in that one little area. And so we were having dinner there again. Same waitress comes up about a week later, and she said, went and talked to my Mormon church. Uh-oh. <laughs> Yeah, so my mom and I are looking for a new church. Okay. <laughs> you know, Funny. And because they go over there and they say, like, well, these Mormon missionaries, like, they're supposedly the biggest missionary movement in the world and all this. And they are. They're getting a lot of converts. They're getting a lot of converts because they're not telling the whole telling story. Telling the whole truth. Yep. So you have, to, you have to do that, too. So it's like... And you know it's it's specific to the different the different things uh, all the stuff you know so like Mormons is one thing what about word of faith movement mm-hmm. I mean what what East African doesn't want perfect health and mm-hmm. perfect wealth mm-hmm. and to what get out a of the person squat? at all yeah I yeah. mean but especially somebody yes. who's like not sure where the next meal is coming right. from so I'm going to take what little bit I have and sow this into the kingdom and hopefully Oof. the Lord's yeah. going to bless me and um, their stories, um, a South American missionary told me he saw people give like the last family pet goat Jeez. to word of faith preachers in hopes that. That is so gross. Oh, I mean, this is why me when you read angry. about the judgment in, that's coming for false teachers, you're like, yeah. I'm not mad about that. And like he, he and I remember him telling me with a tear in his eye, he's like, when you see that, all you can have is indignation. Yeah. I never, I've never seen that. And that's all I can have is indignation. I yeah. mean, it's it's like when you think about what little people have already, and that's one of the things that doing mission work in these areas will do to you immediately. Change your life to walk into the slum of Mombasa. Yeah. And, and go, it's like you stand up to preach, and you're like, what can I say to these people? Like, mm-hmm. y'all preach to me. <laughs> like, I'm just here, you know, it's, you know, and you're standing in front of a woman who had her has a huge scar on her throat, had her head almost cut off by some crazy drug addict person like six months ago and just got out of the prison. She said, glad to have you here to preach. She's a female preacher, but she's like, glad to have you here to preach at my church. I'm like, mm. I want to hear a sermon from you, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. Um, so let me, because so, we, So in, anyway, when you see that kind of stuff, you've got, you have these word of faith movements and you have this prosperity gospel stuff. That's a whole other thing too. Like you have to show them, because they will listen to. That's one of the advantages they have. We have in the global south right now is they still people see scripture. People keep saying global south. What does that mean for our listeners? You know, that means like the majority world context. It okay. means like the you know South America, Africa, um, Southeast Asia. You know, the 1040 window to use another missionary terms, longitude, latitude lines, and things. Um, you know, the under the, the underdeveloped part of the world. The advantage that they have, we have there, is they still see Scripture as authoritative. And if Damn. you show if you show it in the Bible, they're like, oh, well, I didn't realize the Bible taught that. And okay, well, like, that kind of answers the last question I was going to ask, <laughs> um, because we do have to wrap up. But I was thinking what – it almost seems hopeless because you have all of these competing voices in a largely sort of unreached or not reached with much depth areas – so how do you know that you don't leave and then another person comes along and twists things up again and kind of undoes the work mm. you've done? And so what's the sort of final hope in all of this? Like, how can you be hopeful that God's word will? It's what happened to Paul. Mm. Paul preached, people came in later and he had to write, yeah. write a letter. So, right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, well, thankfully, instead of writing epistles, we have Zoom meetings now. <laughs> so we, we, uh, I do have, uh, I, I take this. I take this as a full time job. You yeah. know, this is I'm privileged to have, you know, a support team that's ever growing to help me do this kind of work. Um, you know, the Lord just really obviously has a heart for this. There's so many people get behind us, do a heart of this, have a heart for this that we can do it full time right mm-hmm. now. And so I just take advantage of that. I you know, we have, for instance, in Africa, I found it I try to find leadership oriented guys that are that obviously know their stuff. Like there is a guy <clears throat> One of my, my new friends in Africa, Aseka, that I met this past summer, he'd read Philosophical Foundations of a Christian Worldview by Craig and Moreland Plus. Good grief. Just, just read it. Is that, is that back here? Right by the ESV. 
<laughs> oh yeah, this thing. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. Actually, the newer one's bigger. <laughs> but, oh gosh! But yeah, like this, we have actually more to say. Yeah, so he he read that like twice, and he's like, "That's something a Christian should read every year." I don't know. Oh my gosh! Like, he's read more. He he. We we're having a conversation the other day, and this guy says, <clears throat> "The first four times that I read the abolition of man, <laughs> <laughs> it's like what?" That's uh, C.S. Lewis. Yeah, C.S. Lewis, and a very hard book to read yeah. the first time. But anyway, uh, um, you find guys like that. You find guys like Danson. You find guys that are doing it already and are hungry for the knowledge, hungry for the teaching, and are motivated um, and have solid theology. And thankfully, that's something that Rocio Christie and, and myself, like we, the very first question I had for these guys last summer, the guys that I brought into the ones I'm discipling now over Zoom every two weeks. So let me back up. <clears throat> so you find these kind of guys – you have spend time with them face to face, have long conversations, which is one of the beauties of the mission field. People love to eat and talk, and you mm-hmm. sit there four or five hours. And then after you get to know them, you find out. And I ask them tough questions like, "What are your, you know, <clears throat> what are your beliefs on soteriology? What's your beliefs on the authority of scripture? What's your beliefs on um, theistic evolution? What's your beliefs on these? You know, just kind of gauge where they all are. And then once I figure that out come back home and disciple them. We meet every two weeks on a Zoom call for about three hours. And not just me, but they give presentations. Mm-hmm. And we evaluate each other's presentations. And I get to see what they're learning, and they're they're teaching me things, too. Mm-hmm. So it's not that like I'm going over there as somebody who has all the answers. I'm going over there to discover and help build the church yeah. there in Kenya. So now the part about <clears throat> you lead these, lead these converts, like you – People go over there, like, I didn't just go to Kenya last year. We went to Burundi, and we had about 250 conversions through through some street ministry and stuff over there. But my stipulation for going to work in Burundi was, you're wanting me to go over here and preach with this team. I will do that. But what's the Mm -hmm. follow-up? What are the churches Mm -hmm. that are involved? Come to find out there are Calvary Chapel churches, which are pretty pretty strong, you know, like authority of Scripture bunch and all that. And... um. They said, well, we're, the plan is you're going to go up here in the villages. This this village is unreached. And so we got the privilege of preaching to people that were largely, had mm-hmm. never seen the street evangelists. They'd never heard a Christian preacher. Had some Catholic missionaries come through, but nothing, there, no church in their community. Yeah. So we preached. About 25 people in the village got saved, and they're building a church there the next month. Nice. And like, that's... I don't think going over there just to get numbers right. is like, I don't even really pay attention to numbers as much. Um, we had to in Burundi, but. Well, let but, me, but, let me say this too, just because we've got to close this out. Yeah. That part of the hope that we have in this whole process is that we have the truth on our side. Right. I mean, God's word doesn't return void. Everything that we're saying, we're not saying because we want to get more numbers, like you said, into the church, but because we actually believe that Jesus is who he said he was, and that this is how people can have peace with God and live forever with him. Well, we have to have that faith, too. The question you asked that I was working toward um, was, one's a follow-up. You know, you asked specifically, what hope do I have that somebody doesn't come along behind me? Yeah. One is, what kind of follow-up do people get? Whenever you yeah. do, do teaching like this. And then two, God is sovereign. Yes. I think we can all agree with that. And and I'm not, and I just, on some level, just have to trust him with, it's like, mm-hmm. all right, Lord, I was faithful. I trust you with the results. Yeah. And then pray for the people, you know, probably something I should do more, to be honest, but pray for the people that got converted mm-hmm. under that mm-hmm. ministry, things like that. But um, That's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. I so. love it. Well, I mean, I wish we could talk more, but uh, Mm -hmm. we are out of time. So if people are interested in some of the things you said today or they want to hear more from you, where can people find you? Well, you're welcome to um, reach out to me via email on uh, billscott at ratiochristi.org. By the way, he says it with us like a soft T. It's ratio, R-A-T-I-O. R-A-T-I-O. C H R I S T I dot O R G, which I think that'll probably be in the description of the video, probably. And then, um, of course, we have our own podcast now called The Truth Conversation, which you need to come on. You guys need to Let's hop go. on there and talk about I do culture. charge an honorarium of a thousand dollars, but um, okay, we'll talk about that later. We'll, yeah. we'll uh, we'll, we'll pray about that and we'll <laughs> see if that comes in, uh, but yeah, um, but yeah, I have my own broadcast now called The Truth Conversation, and um, yeah, and um, 
if anybody's watching here in the next couple of weeks and would like to help with one of these trips, I am actually going to uh, work with the underground church in the country that can't be named in about two and a half weeks. Does it rhyme with Zarak? I'm just kidding. You don't <laughs> no, have to say. No. I'm but, being um, silly. But like financial needs are not exactly what we need. We need like... Um, just reach out to me, and I'll I'll say what we need. But Ooh. we need we need a uh, we okay. need we definitely need literature and and good study Bibles, um, in a certain foreign language. Okay, <laughs> is it Farsi? I'm just kidding. I'm going to stop. Um, and there are lots of it places. It does not around. rhyme with Mandarin. <laughs> okay, well, Mandarin's the word. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, well, yes, and of course, anything you want to know about Theology by the Pint, you can find it at theologybythepint.org. Mm-hmm. Come to some of our stuff, subscribe. Um, if you have ideas for the show, hit us up with those. You can contact me or Evan on the leadership page on that uh, website. But until we see you again, we encourage you as always to question freely, think deeply, and disagree as needed.